Hey Indian Creek 8th grade students, welcome to today's e-learning lesson. It is Thursday, April 30th, last day in April. We're so close to May, the last month of the school year. And let's uh, begin with our daily updates. <clears throat> so yesterday we had 46 out of 51 people who turned in their ELA attendance form. I realize that should say 429. Um, that's great, though. That's the highest number that we've had all week. Um, so that was good to see. We had 11, or I'm sorry, 15 out of 51 people who completed the Unit 11 quizzes. Um, that was at least as of maybe a half hour ago. Maybe one or two more people got it in right uh, under the gun. And then we had 31 out of 51 who submitted their current events for social studies. And we will be looking at some of those answers in a minute here. Um, so just make sure that if you're one of those people who didn't turn in your current events article, that you get that turned in as soon as possible, because we are moving on to a new unit today, new project. Um, so we just wouldn't want to see current events get kind of forgotten and, and pushed away. Our class plan for today, we'll go over our Google form. We'll be talking about chapter eight of Animal Farm and the allegory chart sections that are the assignment for today. There is an optional timber pile timeline slide for you to fill out. Uh, should be a relatively easy assignment. It's a different assignment than just the writing responses. And it's looking at the timber pile and, and the drama with that from chapter eight. Just for those of you who would like that extra work. We'll go over the current events for social studies, some of the responses that you all came up with. And then we will be introducing our quote unquote final project of the year. Uh, which is the Decades Project. We'll be talking about that today. Today is just more of an introductory day than anything else. Um, so why don't we jump into some journal highlights from yesterday. The journal prompt was asking you to choose three animated characters that you would like to spend some time with. Now, there were some people who gave live action characters or you know names of characters from TV shows that are you know, in the regular world, that's that's not animated. Animated means, you know, we're talking a cartoon, computer generated, things like that. Um, but some of the highlights we had, a number of different people included one or more of the Disney princesses. So we had Rapunzel, Belle, and Aurora. Uh, Belle showed up again with Wally and Winnie the Pooh. I thought that was kind of a cool uh, trifecta there. We had Moana, Mulan, and Maui. Um, Bart Simpson, Jessica Rabbit, and Stewie Griffin, I feel like that could be a very troublesome bunch. You'd obviously have a lot of fun, but probably get into a little bit of mischief with that group. Uh, SpongeBob, Superman, and Bart Simpson I thought was a, a fun trio just because you have kind of like the innocent, naive SpongeBob, obviously Superman, and then Bart Simpson there to make some trouble. Uh, someone else who wanted to go with Phineas Ferb and then add in Mickey Mouse. Phineas and Ferb was a pair that a couple different people mentioned as well, which I guess if you're going to go with one, you might as well go with the other. Uh, continuing on, we had another person who mentioned Princess Aurora and then Miss Frizzle and Wanda. I had to throw that on there for uh, Magic School Bus sake. Then we had Donkey from Shrek. Um, then we had Poe from Kung Fu Panda, I believe, and then Scooby-Doo, I thought was a good trio. Mater, Sully, and then Remy from Ratatouille, I thought that would be an interesting group. You get some comedy in there, you get Sully looking out for everyone. Uh, one person went with the kind of quintessential animated kind of goofy dad trio of Homer Simpson, Peter Griffin, and Hank Hill. The, the three of those guys, I can only imagine what they would be talking about. Um, someone else went straight Looney Tunes with Speedy Gonzalez, Bugs Bunny, and then uh, Mickey Mouse. So I guess actually not straight Looney Tunes, but three pretty iconic characters. And then finally Baymax, Thumper, and then some of the Minions. So you can see a pretty wide range of animated characters that you all were choosing to spend some time with. So those were some of the journal highlights from yesterday. And then we'll jump over to the Google form for today. So the assignment for language arts today, filling out the allegory chart sections for Minimus and for Mr. Frederick. I had kind of touched on Minimus yesterday um, during the introduction or the allegory chart for Squealer. 
Um, and then Mr. Frederick is one, obviously, based on what happened in Chapter 8, should be pretty obvious. And then the only other thing we had is our attendance response. Um, so for today's attendance response, you are living through a zombie apocalypse. We're, we're going through, you know, typical old trope, zombie apocalypse. You're needing to choose three people who are going to help you survive the zombie apocalypse. Who are you going with? These can be animated characters. These can be characters from a movie or a TV show. So like, uh, you know, some, some kind of action hero or, you know, a real life person. So three people helping you survive the zombie apocalypse. What are you going with? All right, so that's our Google form for today. Let's jump over into talking about Animal Farm Chapter 8. And it looks like, so Molly said to add in, she would go Scooby-Doo, Shaggy, and then Frozone. Interesting. So we get um, two characters, obviously, that fit well, perfectly together. And then I'm assuming that's Frozone from The Incredibles. He's got some pretty unique powers, um, I think would definitely be an interesting trio. So thanks, Molly, for adding that in. Definitely a unique and, and worthwhile entry. So today, um, going back to Animal Farm, we are talking about Chapter 8. We are looking at the timber pile. This is not the only thing that happened in Chapter 8, but kind of the main driving symbol and something that ends up causing a lot of issue for the animals on Animal Farm. So for our summary, after the purge in Chapter 7, the animals realized that the commandments read, no animal shall kill any other animal without cause. So I had mentioned in chapter seven, there are a number of animals who get slaughtered. There obviously is something going against the commandments, but it turns out another commandment has changed and the animals are sure that they just forgot the words without cause and they eventually move on with their lives. The animals struggle through cold and hunger to rebuild the windmill, but according to Squealer's statistics, Life has never been better on Animal Farm. And this is all said to be thanks to Napoleon, who has been given many positive titles. Then at the same time, Napoleon negotiates with their human neighbors to sell a pile of timber. When it appears that he is selling to Mr. Pilkington, the animals are taught to hate Frederick and vice versa. And Snowball is always said to be hiding out at whichever farm is their target of dislike. So they go back and forth. One minute, they're against Frederick, and that's where Snowball's hanging out. Then they're said to be against Pilkington, and then now all of a sudden it turns out that Snowball is actually in with Pilkington. So after the animals are nearly convinced that the timber will be sold to Pilkington, and Napoleon has been spreading the line, Death to Frederick, it is announced that the timber will actually be sold to Frederick after all. The pigs claim that this was all Napoleon's cunning and marvel at the fact that he refused to accept a check and instead demanded cash for the timber. To add to the excitement, the animals also finish the windmill. So a lot of good things going on. There's some money coming in. The windmill's done. Life is about to get even better than it has been. Napoleon soon finds out that Frederick's money was fake and Frederick launches an attack on Animal Farm. The animals watch in terror as Frederick's men blow up the windmill. This spurs them to fight the men off, but several animals die in the process and Boxer is seriously wounded. Squealer claims that there has been a victory and a ceremony to celebrate their victory somewhat raises the animal spirits. Soon after, the pigs discover a case of whiskey in the basement. That night, strange noises are heard in the farmhouse, and the next morning, the pigs look ill and word spreads that Comrade Napoleon is dying. Now, obviously, the animals are broken up about this, but by the evening, he has recovered, and soon it is said that the pigs are growing barley and have bought booklets on brewing. The next night, Squealer is discovered with a paintbrush having fallen from a ladder near the commandments. Another commandment has changed, claiming now that no animal shall drink alcohol to excess. The animals again blame their faulty memories for forgetting these last couple of words. So lots of changes. 
obviously very dramatic chapter in terms of everything going on with the timber pile and then obviously frederick and his men blowing up the windmill just after it had been completed so just like last time um, i'm gonna jump over here into the text of the story and actually i'll uh, zoom in a little bit um, because there are a number of important quotes to talk about and I didn't want to just limit them to going through a whole bunch of slides. I thought it would be better highlight this stuff in the story for you all to read anyway. So um, this first part is just the change to the first commandment that no animal shall kill any other animal without cause. Um, and just the fact that the animals think through this that, oh, they must have just forgotten these last two words. And so now it makes sense why the other animals were slaughtered because they were in with Snowball. And so, of course, the pigs had the right to kill them. Or I guess technically the pigs had the right to order the dogs to kill them. So just kind of another theme, the animals convincing themselves that they can't remember, the fact that they're not that smart coming back to hurt them and something the pigs can take advantage of. All right, uh, this next short little quote, it's just Squealer. It said that he has a strip of paper and reads off figures that claim how great life is on Animal Farm, that production is up, that there's more food. And the quote goes, the animals saw no reason to disbelieve him, especially as they could no longer remember very clearly what conditions had been like before the rebellion. All the same, there were days when they felt they would sooner have had less figures and more food. So this is important because the animals now, it turns out, have forgotten what life is like before the rebellion. And so this is just another thing that the pigs can take advantage of, that their memories have even forgotten what it was like in those early days of freedom. But this also shows that they do have that sense in the back of their mind that they would have actually had less of these statistics and more food in their bellies. So just reinforcing that they can get these senses of what they want, but they cannot actually, you know, put them into words and explain them. Um, another section here, this next one, again, Squealer, where he is giving speeches about Napoleon, talks about how he's got tears rolling down his cheeks, talking about the love that Napoleon has for all animals and you know, drawing contrast to animals who are living on other farms, how things are so much better, and the fact that it had become usual to give Napoleon credit for every successful achievement and stroke of good fortune. So just reinforcing Napoleon's standing as a dictator and just another sad fact that everything that goes well on the farm is attributed to Napoleon. And this is all because of Squealer, his ability to convince the other animals and their inability to think for themselves. So now everything good is being granted to Napoleon, or I should say being, being uh, credited to Napoleon. All right, so now we'll skip forward a little bit, uh, talking a little bit about the timber pile, and now we come down here to the section where, yes, the animals have completed the windmill and you know the the through everything that they had to go through the animals are exhausted but they're so proud of what they've done and the walls were built twice as thick so there's a section here that's a little bit of foreshadowing that says nothing short of explosives would lay them low this time and so the animals are just so excited and I also included the very end of this paragraph because the final section talks about how Napoleon comes down to inspect the work and congratulates the animals and announces that the wind or the mill is going to be named Napoleon Mill. So through all the work that the other animals have done, they're so excited, their lives are gonna get so much better. But at the end of the day, who does it get named for? Napoleon, because you know, he gets credit for every good thing. And here's a good thing that's supposed to change life on the farm. And of course, then it needs to be named after him. 
So then we can scroll down a little bit here. This is talking about the section of the sale of the timber pile where, you know, Napoleon's genius has forced Frederick to pay more. And because Napoleon was unwilling to take a check, he forced Frederick to pay for the windmill in cash. And so there is this kind of little, you know, succession line where Napoleon is sitting on a bed of straw. He's got the money at his side and all of the animals are coming by to look at the look at the bills and sniff them and, and look at just how great it is. Again, another celebration of Napoleon's genius and just another example of celebrating something from him that actually turns out to not be so positive because it turns out that the money was fake anyway. And so we scroll down through here, we had the battle um, where the men pack the windmill with blasting powder, they blow it up, and there's a battle where the animals eventually do force the men off of the farm, but they are beaten, they're bruised, they're bloodied. But at the end, after the men are chased off, Squealer comes out and is firing the gun. And so Boxer asks him why, and Squealer talks about how there is this victory and they need to celebrate it. And Boxer's not really convinced, you know, he's been shot, he's hurt. But not only that, they also lost the windmill. But Squealer says, you know, we've, we've protected Animal Farm and we can rebuild the windmill and we have won back every inch of the farm. And Boxer just has this very sad line that says, then we have won back what we had before. And that's just interesting because the whole idea of animalism and Animal Farm was about life being better than it was before. And now Squealer is spreading this idea that just keeping what they have is enough to be considered a victory. And then, so down here at the very end, it talks about how there is this celebration that the, the green flag is flying, the gun is firing, Napoleon makes a speech, and so to the animals in the end, it is in their minds a great victory, even though I think all of you would agree that it's not really quite the same as a great victory when you're not gaining land, you lose this windmill you've worked on for years, and there are deaths around the farm. But the animals can't think for themselves, so that's what it is that happens. All right, and then I didn't highlight any of this, I don't believe, at the bottom. Um, but just obviously, so it's made clear, the whole idea with the pigs finding the whiskey and then Napoleon quote unquote dying, I think everyone is aware that what happened is they just, you know, enjoyed themselves a little bit too much. And then it turns out that not only are they going to continue drinking alcohol, which is one of the commandments that said would never happen, now they're actually going to start growing barley, which is used to make beer and liquor. And the other commandment has been changed that now it's no animal shall drink alcohol to excess. So they can drink, but just not quote unquote too much. What is too much you might ask? That is of course left purposefully unsaid so that the pigs can just decide for themselves what would be too much, all right? So that is chapter eight. Um, we can jump back here into the barn updates and you can see that we have actually had two more commandments change. We have no animal shall drink alcohol to excess and no animal shall kill any other animal without cause. So two more commandments have changed and uh, things are looking very different than they were originally when the seven commandments of animalism were created all right so that's all for chapter eight um and just to show the allegory chart characters to update for today i would like for you to go through and fill out the allegory chart for minimus and for mr frederick minimus is very closely related to squealer i talked about it yesterday they can essentially be interchanged or both incorporate ideas of two different 
different groups on that chart. So Minimus and then Mr. Frederick, hopefully the fact that he is a human, he's a leader of another farm, one that actually comes and attacks Animal Farm, after, you know, kind of screwing Animal Farm over, stabbing them in the back. Um, that should be pretty obvious as to who that represents from history. So those are the two to fill out uh, for today. And then the other assignment, the optional assignment for language arts is this slide that I sent out, the Animal Farm Timber Negotiations. And all it is is one slide, it's a timeline where I would like for you to fill out four events that are related to the timber negotiations. So you can talk about how at one point it looked like they were gonna sell to Pilkington and then to Frederick and the whole deal with Snowball. Then obviously the fact that it eventually gets sold to Frederick, what happens with the money and then what that eventually leads to on Animal Farm. So a number of different ways you can go. I'm just asking you to fill out the four events. Um, each of you has your own slide. And like I said, this is an optional assignment. Uh, but again, one that you can fill out looking for the opportunity to boost that grade. Um, and these are, this is an assignment that will be due tomorrow. All right, so that is all for language arts. Fill out your allegory chart for Minimus, Mr. Frederick, and then this optional timber negotiation slide if you would like to do that as well. Okay. So I will uh, hold on for a second. We're going to switch over to social studies, talk about our current events from yesterday. Uh, and so if you want to open yours up, because there were still a handful of people who didn't turn theirs in, that is totally okay with me. So this was an article from New LA or New Zella that was looking at some of the different things that families are doing during our time of quarantine, some of the things that celebrities are doing. And so there were two questions for you to answer and these answers all came from the people who turned in their current events. So none of this is from me. So I appreciate those of you who turned in your current events um, because without you, I obviously wouldn't be able to, to go over this stuff. So. After reading the article, the first question said, what new entertainment discoveries, videos, activities have you found during quarantine? And so some of the highlights that you all included, Mark Rober's science class series, which I, I do have to say is a very well done series, very interesting. We had another student who talked about playing multiple versions of poker at home with her family. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are playing cards. I, I love playing card games. so. Um, I thought that was a good one. Uh, we have another person mentioned TikTokers creating positive and uplifting songs and dances. Uh, we had another student I thought was funny who talked about being so bored they've started to clean the house all on his own. Um, I think that's really just a sign of how long we've been in quarantine and how much time people have had to keep things up around the house that everything else is done. There's nothing left to do but clean. We have another student who mentioned the Snapchat series, Will From Home, starring Will Smith. Love Will Smith. I'm sure that I haven't seen these, but I'm sure that they're good just because I feel like everything he does is great. Um, another student talked about riding four wheelers and her Polaris. Um, another person saw some room makeovers on TikTok. And then another student specifically talking about getting into a lot more of crafts just because of the amount of time on her hands. So a lot of different activities. And it seemed like people were kind of 50-50 on whether they thought they would keep these up or not. Um, it seems like the people who mentioned having extra time on their hands were more in the realm of, I don't think I'll do this because I won't have as much time once quarantine's over. But a lot of people who talked about like social media things or things that you can do outside, especially because it's getting warmer, we're getting close to summer, would be keeping them up. And then question two, uh, what ways do you think life will change forever as a result of this pandemic and why? So we had um, 
people who said that they think that this will go down in history as what not to do when this is a global pandemic. I thought that was kind of funny just because, I mean, with, there's so much learning going on and so many different things. Um, we had another person say, I don't think that anything will change for an extended period of time. I thought that that was important to bring up just because I hope that there are some things that change. I mean, just I think this this student had a good point. He brought up the Spanish flu and that in the end, life rel went relatively back to normal. But I feel like the danger of another outbreak and just the fact that, you know, these viruses can change so quickly in ways that we're not prepared for. Um, I think that there, I hope that there are certain things that change just to kind of protect our society and so that we don't have to go into a shelter in place or quarantine like this. But, you know, who knows exactly what will happen. A um, couple people talked about in terms of staying clean, people realizing how important toilet paper, hand sanitizer and wet wipes are and people being more aware of people around them, being careful when they're coughing, sneezing, et cetera. Um, I hope that that's true just because, I mean, a lot of you know one of my pet peeves is people who don't cover their mouth when they cough or sneeze. Hopefully that's something that people take into account moving forward because they don't want to spread those germs. Um, but we'll see. We had a number of different people who talked about the effect on businesses. Um, people who mentioned, you know, working from home more and not commuting to work as often. And then sadly, this person, and I think they're right, that a lot of small businesses won't open again just because there won't be enough money to open them. Um, that's an unfortunately, I hate to say it, but it's looking like that's going to be a true fact. Um, I forget the percent of Americans who are employed by small businesses, but it's a very high percentage. And that means that there's going to be a lot of people looking for work and a lot of areas of the country that are hurting to have money come in. And especially the longer this lockdown goes, the, the more these businesses are going to be hurt by the pandemic. We had a couple other people talk about that there won't be large gatherings and that people might be nervous or scared about going to places like the gym or anywhere in close contact just because they're worried about being infected. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, graduations, prom, all types of different large gatherings are kind of the, you know, those are the things that are most questioned and people are missing out on the most, but at the same time are, are probably gonna be the last areas and the last events that are opened up following this quarantine. And I mean, who knows when, as a country, these events are going to be allowed. So I'm hoping because, you know, that we're talking about sports and concerts and all kinds of other celebrations and events. And, you know, those are all things that people like to do. Um, you know, for example, like I said, going to the movies. I mean, now that we have streaming and all these other, you know, services for, for movies to be put out, our movie theater is just kind of going to go by the wayside because you're in a, an enclosed space and you know you can get your entertainment from other places. I don't know. It'll be interesting to see. Um, and then I wanted to end with these. I was very happy to read these, that there were a number of people who talked about kind of rediscovering an appreciation for friends and, and family and getting to go outside because you know sometimes those are things that are taken for granted when things are good and it takes a pandemic like this for us to appreciate our loved ones and you know just how nice it is to be able to get out and go for a walk or just to get to go over and, and talk to your neighbors for a little bit or get together with people who you live by and um and so i i do hope that this is a time that teaches us to appreciate our loved ones and being grateful for the time that we get to spend with our friends and our family members. You know, I, I hope that all of you are getting to spend time with your families. You know, I can say, for example, that uh, just having to, to talk to friends and relatives over Zoom calls and things like that, it's, it's obviously just not the same. And uh, so I'm very much looking forward to the chance to, you know, get to, to hang out with friends and to give my mom a hug and and do you know those types of things that you don't even necessarily think about 
until you don't get to do them anymore. Um, so, but I thought that was a good set to end on um, because uh, at the end of the day, even though this is an unprecedented time and a difficult time, hopefully there are positive things that we can take from it. And I think that appreciation for our loved ones is definitely something that we can take from that. All right. So now to transition over to the assignment that was sent out today. So for our final social studies unit of the year, we went through civil rights. And so we kind of got cut off towards the end of the 1960s. And we have basically a 50 year gap left to bring us up to the present. So your final project is to create a set of slides or some other type of presentation about a specific decade from that chunk of time that's left over, the 70s to the present. And this is something that if we were in class, we'd get to do a little bit more intensively. Um, you know, you'd get to actually give a lesson, a presentation to your classmates. But so for this, we decided we're gonna kind of scale it back and then you can go into as much detail as you would like, all right? So I'm not gonna read through every single direction, but just essentially that you're gonna be choosing a decade and there are five main areas that you wanna talk about from that decade. Important events, important people, politics, inventions and technology, and then values and culture. So you can research those different things and then put together a Google Slides set or other kind of presentation material to show what you've learned about your decade. And then here, you can work with a partner if you would like, just please be clear about what's expected and have a plan for how you're gonna share your work because obviously most of you aren't able to actually get together in person. Um, but I know that you know between your Chromebook and email and text and phone and all that stuff, you can work together. Just please make sure that you're prepared for that so that there's no risk of one partner doing 90% of the work and someone else just kind of, you know, slacking off. Same, same worries we'd have as if we were in person, just I feel like reinforced in, in these times. So um, then I gave you some ideas for enrichment. So in other words, if you cover those required areas, these are some other things that you can look into if you have time and want to go a little bit further. You can also look more deeply into specific moments or people. So do a profile of one person or a single slide on a specific event, or you can do anything else you can think of. All right, this is essentially create slides or whatever other presentation to get an overview. And then if you want to dive deeper, you can dive deeper. All right, that is up to each of you. So then these are just some of the presentation areas to help you get started. Um, I listed out the possible decades for you. I'm not gonna read through all these, but these are just here for you to help. I gave you a rough outline of the plan so that for today, choose your decade on the Google form, which I'll show in a minute, and then the, your partner if you're gonna have one. Then spend about the next week or so researching your decade and then the next week creating your slides or presentation. All right, so Paige just asked, is there a minimum amount of slides we need to have? I would say Paige, a minimum would be, you have these five main areas, events, people, politics, inventions and tech and values. I would say a minimum of one slide for each of those, plus a title slide. So I think that means a minimum would be six. Um, but I think that once you get into researching and things like that, you'll have no trouble um, creating more than that. So start with those six, and then if you feel like you're ahead of the game, then you can start to add more, all right? And moving forward, I will show some example slides and presentations. Um, I'm just not gonna do it today because I can see we're already at 34 minutes, and I don't wanna take up your whole day with this live stream. Um, even though I appreciate those of you who are watching just to, to learn more about this. All right, so here are the questions for you to think about when you're doing research. And then I also shared with you this Google Sheet that has some ideas for you to look into based on your decade and the different areas. So for example, 
let's say you were to choose the 90s, some of the important events you could look at are the end of the Cold War, the Berlin Wall fall are falling, Princess Diana, the shooting at Columbine, all different types of things. I gave you some important people, politics, just all types of different things that you can think about. These aren't required for you to include, but you can include them if you want. Um, Emma's asking, do we have to do slides or could we do a poster? You absolutely can do a poster. I, f I trust that you can do all of this on a poster, especially if it's a larger poster board, or I mean, if you're gonna do like one of those trifolds or multiple posters, you can do it that way too. I know um, some of you have mentioned being a little craftier. So if you happen to be that person and wanted to let your creativity come out in a poster or trifold, um, Emma, you can absolutely do that as well. All right. So this um, Google Sheet is just here as ideas for you. You can add more, uh, pick from which of these you want to talk about. And um, just again, make this your own. You know, we were kind of debating between do we want to do a kind of scaled down project of what we would have done where you get a little bit more freedom, you can work at your own pace or do more like class individual work. We went with this, so hopefully this is something you find interesting. Um, and we apologize if not, um, but this is just something the kids really enjoyed doing last year. So that's why, we, why we're gonna try and keep it rolling for this year. All right, so then for today, the only thing that I, we really want you to make sure you turn in is this Google form that was sent out asking you to choose which decade you want to do your project on. So you have the question of which decade you're going to look into, going to do your research on. Are you going to be working with a partner, yes or no? And then if you are, just please let us know who your partner is going to be. All right, so no need to send this in right away. You know, take your time, call or email your friends if you want to work with a partner. And the nice thing is, just in case anyone's wondering, you do not have to work only with a person who is in your own social studies class. So if you are in my social studies section and want to partner with someone from Mr. Rausch's class or Ms. Watson's class, you can do that. All right, just make sure that you're both clear on that you're going to be partnering up and, uh, and then have a plan for how you're going to break the work up. All right, I know this is kind of a bigger project, so any other questions that you come up with um, today, tomorrow, Email me, or Mr. Roush, Ms. Watson, and we can do what we can to help you out. All right. And then, like I said, on these streams moving forward, I will have some examples of slides that were done in the past just to give you a sense of things you can include and uh, how your project can look. All right. But, but that is the final uh, project that we have for social studies for this school year. So really, I mean, if it doesn't feel like we're in the home stretch yet, hopefully, you know, this is it because uh, we're down to basically three weeks, not even um, for, for classes left. So pretty wild. I mean, I know this last month feels like it's taken a year and a half, but, but we're getting there. So um, yeah, like I said, any questions you have, Email me, Mr. Roush, Ms. Watson, and we will be happy to help you, all right? Um, I apologize for how long this video has been. This has been maybe the longest stream. Um, that's what happens going through a, a very long chapter of Animal Farm and introducing a whole new project. So I apologize and thank you again to those of you who have tuned in or watched any of this um, afterwards on YouTube. So one more time just to recap, Animal Farm, fill out your allegory chart for Mr. Frederick and for Minimus. And then there is the optional um, timber pile negotiation slide for those of you who would like to do that. Tomorrow's Friday, which means it's gonna be genius hour day. Um, so that's where we're at for language arts. And then for social studies, just make sure you've got your current events turned in and then choose the decade and possible partner that you're going to do your final project for social studies on. All right. Again, any questions, please, please, please email me um, and I will do my best to help you out. 
Um, other than that, I think that's all I have for you all today. Um, everyone else or everyone have a, a great rest of your day. Um, I'll be back tomorrow to provide some updates and things like that. Um, but until then, like I said, feel free to reach out. All right, everyone have a safe and healthy rest of your day. And uh, this is Professor Blazek signing off.